to our scripture for this morning, which is chapter 15 of the Gospel of John, just verses 9 through 17, as we work our way through that text. And allow me the privilege of reading to you. But Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of the Lord. Now let me pray. Lord, I thank you for how you have been working in my heart all this week to prepare this message, and I pray that it is a blessing to all who hear it, as it has blessed me in recording it. And I just pray, Lord, for your blessing on our time together in your word, that we will be touched in our hearts by your Holy Spirit at work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. The kind of love that Jesus is talking about here is quite profound. Some of the thoughts are repeated from earlier chapters that we've been going through. Remain in my love is the same as abide in me, keep my commandments, love one another. We've heard that before. But what's a little different is a taste of the intensity of the kind of love that Jesus is talking about, where he says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Do you love any of your friends that much? Well, we know that is what Jesus has done for us. And he literally calls the disciples his friends if they continue to obey his commands by loving God and loving one another. And again, this does not mean that we have to live up to this standard in order to get saved. But Jesus means that if we truly do understand and believe the gospel, once we are born again through faith in Jesus, then we will keep his commands. We will want to. And we will have the ability to do so because of the Holy Spirit in us. And this is something that we grow into as we walk with the Lord. We often call it sanctification. Justification, forgiveness is by faith in Christ. And sanctification also, growing in grace, is also by faith in Christ. So with that, I want to show you a brief six-minute video in which this issue is explained. And the picture in the bulletin insert is one of the scenes from this video. This was produced by a Methodist pastor named J.D. Walt about 11 years ago. Kathy and I have been reading his morning devotionals called the Seedbed Wake-Up Call. His mission in life now is to help spark revival by getting Christians to fully understand where the true gospel really takes us. Let's watch the video. In 2011, George Barna conducted a research project that he claims is one of the most challenging projects he ever undertook. Over the period of six years, his organization made telephone contacts with 15,000 people. And they were asking them questions about their spiritual life, their Christian faith formation and development. They were trying to ascertain where are people in North America in their walk with God, so to speak. The results were astonishing. Barna found from his research that people tend to find themselves at one or another of what he 
calls the 10 transformational stops. Number one, unaware of sin. Number two, indifferent to sin. Number three, worried about sin. Number four, forgiven from sin. Number five, forgiven and active in the church, in the activities of the church. Number six, holy discontent. Number seven, broken by God. Number eight, surrender and submission. Number nine, profound love for God. And number 10, profound love for people. It gets really interesting when you see where the population of Americans fall across the spectrum. 1%, 16%, 9%, 9%, 24%, 6 6%, 3%, 1%, 0.5%, and 0.5%. It's not surprising to see most of the action centering around numbers 3 through 5. You're a sinner, you need a savior. Pray this prayer and you're forgiven. Now get involved in the church. What's fascinating though is the way the spectrum begins to break down after the first half. From number six, holy discontent, through number 10, profound love of God and people, nine and 10. Only 11% of the population fall within that range. On the other side, one through five, we see 89% of the American population according to this research. It seems clear that we're going halfway, but not the other half. You see, John Wesley said the people uh, called Methodists were raised up for this second half. In fact, he used the language. He said that this gospel, this truth of sanctification, of holiness, is the grand depositum which God has seemingly raised up the Methodist people to proclaim. And from this research, it looks as though we have not proclaimed it very well. So Seedbed earnestly desires to see the bars get raised on the right hand side of the chart. On justification by grace through faith, we stand squarely with the magisterial reformers of the church. But we think today what is most needed is a revolution of sanctification, a renaissance of scriptural holiness. In the 18th century, Count Zinzendorf, who was a founder of a Moravian community at Hernhut, great influence on the Wesleyan movement, maybe said it best when he said, many people will follow the Lord halfway, but not the other half. He said they will willingly give up possessions and property and wealth, but it touches them too deeply to disown themselves. You see, that's what the whole gospel is about. It's about profound love for God and profound love for people. Seabed exists to sow that whole gospel into the whole world. Will you join us? Now, I want to go through that list of transformational moments again. And I put a screenshot of this chart in your bulletins. You could see that says, progress along the path of discipleship, and that's the way I will talk about it. Each of us ought to be able to remember whether or not we have lived through any or all of these transformational moments and how God's work in our lives has transformed us into his friends. 
Everybody starts here, trapped in sin without even knowing it. We are ignorant of the concept or existence of sin. We know that everybody starts here because the scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fortunately for our nation and for them, only 1% of the 15,000 Americans interviewed report being stuck here. Next comes awareness of sin, but indifferent to it. This is typically what happens as children, uh, you know, come on. <laughs> My computer is playing games with me. Well, this is typically what happens as children hear things, learn the gospel, learn the right and wrong. Uh, there we go. It's back. Come on, do it right. I just can't preach off the cuff, so. Give it a try. <laughs> uh, I might have to close this and start it up again. My screen is blank. How sad. How tragic. I'm going to open it again. Let's see if it runs this time. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> this is typically what happens as children receive moral instruction. Some obey their parents, some don't. Teenagers often rebel by doing things they know they shouldn't, and they don't care. They are indifferent to the consequences of sin. Adults also can go for a long, long time like that. It is a transformational moment to realize that there is such a thing as sin or right and wrong. But if that doesn't bother you because you just want to do your own thing, well, people can live a long time without getting to the next transformational moment. I've known a few church people who were self-righteous churchgoers who still lived however they wanted to, except maybe on Sunday. That describes me when I was going to church during my high school years. 16% of the interviewed reside here. The third transformational moment often happens when people are in crisis. Addicts call it hitting rock bottom. It doesn't have to get that bad. It did for me. But a lot of people get concerned about the sins in their lives when it's just pointed out to them or talked about, such as at a Christian summer camp, around the campfire, or in church too. Sometimes people who haven't really heard or understood the message of the gospel for a while start hearing it and actually get convicted of sin. And suddenly they're concerned about sin, about the implications of personal sin. 39% of the people reside in this realm. So far, we've already talked about 56% of the people in or near our churches, and they're not yet saved. Such people often just try to behave better. If they think they're good at that, they can end up like the self-righteous churchgoer and remain indifferent to other sins that yet remain in their lives. Tellingly, I recently read a quote in a book called The Gospel for Real Life by Jerry Bridges. He pointed out that human morality, rather than flagrant sin, is the greatest obstacle to the gospel today. The average person still thinks they get to heaven by being good. On the other hand, some people fail at being very good. They can end up living with a sense of defeat for a while, but either way, if they hear and believe the gospel, then the fourth generational movement can happen. Transformational moment can happen. Confession of and forgiveness for sin. 9% of respondents acknowledge that they have received forgiveness, but that they're not active in the church. That means beyond attending, they do not serve. They're saved, but going no further in discipleship. But a good portion of saved people, 24% of all respondents, do go on to serve in church. They have experienced the fifth transformational moment. They exhibit a commitment to faith activities. And by the way, have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? 
it says that 20% of the people do 80% of the work in any organization. And with only 24% actively serving in church besides attending, that pretty much corresponds to the 80-20 rule. I find that interesting. Now at this point, we have talked about 89% of all the people who responded to the Barna survey. 13,350 people out of the 15,000 have gone through five of the ten transformational moments. There are still five more transformational moments that lead to what Barnett calls a fully formed, mature faith. Transformed individuals are those who have aligned their intellect, emotions, behavior, and spirit with the call and the ways of God. The second half of the Christian life is learning more about what a friend we have in Jesus. Learning how to follow and obey the risen Jesus with a humble, childlike spirit. Barna's survey revealed that this usually began with experiencing a prolonged period of spiritual discontent, holy discontentment. That's the sixth transformational moment. Only 6% of the survey respondents reported experiencing this. But here's where I notice something and make my own observation. Very few people identify holy discontent as a positive transformational moment that led them closer to Christ. I think maybe they do experience this nagging sense that there must be something more, but they're not prepared for it by church teaching. They don't understand what's really happening. Holy discontentment is uncomfortable, and we prefer our comfort. So for the majority, I think they decided something like this. This church isn't feeding me anymore. It must be time to change churches or maybe just stop going. I'm not happy with how church is going, so I'll just quit. And they try to resolve their discontentment that way. And if that is how they are responding to holy discontent and they do change churches or quit going, then they kind of stunt their growth or start over and don't make any further progress into the later stages. But if they recognize that holy discontent is inviting them to go deeper in a relationship with Jesus, then they move on. Only 6% confess experiencing holy discontent. Only 3% confess to experiencing the next transformational moment, the most uncomfortable one of all, experiencing personal brokenness. It's almost parallel to moment number four where confession of sin and receiving forgiveness is to experience a kind of brokenness when you have to acknowledge that you're not good enough, that you need Jesus' grace for forgiveness. But the challenging element here is that after forgiveness and after learning about right and wrong in moments four and five, in moment number seven, the person has tried to live the way Jesus asks us to and has been active in church until that leads to that discontentment of six. And then number seven is when they realize that not only can they not save themselves from sin, but they also cannot change their heart character to live a good life without surrendering to Jesus. This is where people experiencing this fruitfully really start to cling to Jesus as the vine, the only true source of real life. Brokenness here means that you have tried to live for Jesus, but maybe it seems like he hasn't lived up to his end of the bargain. You're not healed. You're not successful. Sometimes you've even experienced a profound failure or a devastating loss. And this can be at the beginning or at the end of a period of grief over how you wish life had gone and why Jesus didn't help you do what you wanted to do. And that leads to the next gospel choice. The eighth transformational moment is choosing to surrender and submit fully to God. A pastor friend of mine, Eric Johnson, put it this way, if you want to experience the full version of life that Jesus wants for you, then your version of life and what you want for you or what you want Jesus to do for you has to die. It has to be nailed to the cross, buried in the tomb, and left there. 
That is full surrender. Dying to self to live for Jesus. But only 3% of respondents report experiencing this. That looks to me as if half of the 6% who feel broken try to pull themselves together and go back to live with their discontent and even try to resolve that, maybe with changing churches or something else. Only 3% see no other way but to trust Jesus, cling to him more, and fully surrender. They're the ones who learn that Jesus is worthy and they fall in love with him even more. They truly live into the gospel and bear fruit because they cling to Jesus and call him friend even if they don't get what they want out of life but only what Jesus is giving. They're the ones who experience a profound love for God which is transformation moment number nine. And living there for a while, they sooner or later get to transformation moment number ten experiencing a profound compassion and love for people, for humanity. And now God wants all of us to get there because there is no power to Christianity if our love does not exceed the world's concept of love. This is the profound kind of love that I call otherish. You know, that's my favorite word. Some people say that the best kind of love is selfless love. But and I say, well, that's not quite expressing it right because selfless is still got self in it, just a little bit less. So the correct opposite of selfish, I think, is otherish. It's all focused on how my life can be lived to move others a step closer to faith in Jesus. My needs become unimportant because I know the Good Shepherd will provide for me. What is most important is that people are dying without Jesus. And God wants me to partner with him in the rescue mission. Love risks reaching out to save the lost. That's how Jesus' friends bear fruit on the vine. Now what's important for us to think about is why so many Christians are maybe stuck in moments 3, 4, and 5. 89% of people who call themselves Christians live here. What's the great barrier to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10? If 9 and 10 represent that place where we do love God and love other people the way Jesus really wants his friends to do, why is it so hard to go there? I'm going to suggest that for, in, for many years, the American institutional church has failed to teach its Christians about this part of the gospel, what J.D. Walt calls the second half of the gospel. It is still gospel. It is still by faith and not by works. Remember, fruitfulness comes from clinging to Jesus. The second half of the gospel, though, represents a big shift. And this shift is also expressed nicely by more from J.D. Walt. It's a shift, listen, from Jesus as my Savior to Jesus as my Lord. From the Holy Spirit as an interesting idea to the Holy Spirit is in me, an infused reality. It's a shift from deliverance from the penalty for sin to also deliverance from the power of sin. A shift from forgiveness for sins to freedom from sin. A shift from justification by grace through faith to sanctification by grace through faith. It's from Lord you took me out of Egypt to now take Egypt out of me. It's a transformation from God as king and judge to God as Abba, Father, who loves me so much. From true in principle to true in fact. From Christian in name to Christian in game. From a life of commitment to a life of consecration. It goes from I'm not perfect, just forgiven, over to I'm not just forgiven, I'm being made perfect. George Barna wrote a caution as part of his comments on this research because the traditional church's focus on numbers and programs means most Christians mirror cultural goals desiring happiness, comfort, security, belonging, and popularity. Surprisingly few are focused on completely cooperating with God to experience the kind of whole life transformation described in the Bible. 
and made possible only through a partnership with God. The lack of understanding of the true goals of a truly Christian life prevents people from making the extraordinary life transitions that are possible. And I'm saying that lack of understanding isn't all each person's fault. I'm saying that understanding is re rarely there because the churches haven't taught it well. I want this congregation to learn it better. Programmatic churches like people who work and serve to run the programs. They don't want people to be discontent, not even if that's holy. Programmatic churches want people to remain comfortable in their roles so things remain stable and the church business just chugs along safely. Barna also determined that most church programs are designed to help people get to stop five on the journey, but not to move further down the road to Christ-likeness. That's my own observation, that stop five is where the institutional church accidentally likes to keep people active in ministry, habituated to their roles there, and content in their comforts with that. That minimizes risk and undercuts adventures of faith. That's the kind of thing that helps churches attract more and more people, and it makes it look like the church is growing, but it's only growing in numbers and not so much in depth of commitment to God. Even Bill Hybels noticed this some years ago in his mega church called Willow Creek. He said that he realized the process of discipleship employed in his church was like a mile wide and an inch deep. They had a wide audience, lots and lots of people who made decisions for Christ and added to the programs, but only a few were going deeper in their relationship with God to really know Jesus as their truest friend. I pray that the church I serve will be filled with people who are clearly taught the full gospel and eagerly desire to let God lead them into deeper friendship and partnership with Jesus. Barna also pointed out that the biblical pattern of spiritual development usually shows people who experience the brokenness in Transformation Moment 7. In the Bible, this often happens before they become born again, as in moment number 4. However, he found that Americans typically follow a different ordering of the experiences than that identified in the scriptures. That's the ordering I laid out for you earlier. Barna thinks that the reordering is responsible for the prolonged time it takes so many Americans to make real spiritual progress past number five. And I agree, but I still personally think it's more on the church leaders and denominations that have not taught this well. And think about how, what a challenge it is. Just think of all the kids who are raised in church. They hear about the gospel of forgiveness of sins from a very early age and are encouraged to ask Jesus into their hearts and make confession of faith and get baptized if that hasn't already happened. They're also taught the morals of right and wrong. From a very early age, the church children learn how to act like Christians and get rewarded for good behavior. They are also protected and sheltered by responsible parents. So when do they ever get to experience any brokenness that leads them to really rely on Jesus? When God sends us kids to care about, we're going to have to figure out how to help them understand both halves of the gospel, justification and sanctification, so that when they're growing into their rebellious years and they're feeling that holy discontent that actually causes teenagers to rebel from the ways of their parents, we can explain what's really going on, that God is calling them into a deeper relationship with him. The research also showed that people are transformed through a combination of experience, knowledge, and relationships. The absence of any one of those components can also inhibit a person's growth. Experiences are God's way of doling out life and encounters with him. Knowledge comes from studying the Bible so that we learn the full truth about the gospel and learn how to understand and interpret our experiences. And relationships has everything to do with fellowship with mature Christians. Whether they're farther along or not, they are people with whom we can talk and pray about our experiences and our Bible knowledge. And by the way, I'll just mention 
Celebrate Recovery was specifically designed as a ministry that provides that safe environment where people can help each other acknowledge and understand their brokenness, gain the knowledge of the gospel from the Bible, and grow in their relationship with Christ. And I think church on Sunday should be much more like Celebrate Recovery on Friday to do all that. Looking at transformation as the process that enables us to gradually die to sin, self, and society in order to fully and profoundly love God and people, Barna explained that Jesus himself defined the destination of the journey when he taught his followers that the most important ex exhortations from God were to love God and to love people with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. Paul is one of the classic examples of a transformed person. And he underscored the necessity of this quest when he said that the only thing that matters is being transformed by God into a new creation. Transformation, then, is a result of clinging to Jesus in his word so that we become holy by fully submitting to God and consistently pursuing his will, being set apart by the blood of Christ to experience a unique freedom and a new identity through the power of that blood and the enduring guidance of the Holy Spirit. Cling to Jesus as his friend. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And by the way, Paul is also an example of moving quickly through a bunch of transformational moments all bunched together. He was a religious self-righteous Pharisee, so we could say he had gotten through moments one, two, and three. Skipped four because he wasn't born again and ended at five, he was very active in his religion. Then he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and was immediately broken, knocked off his horse and struck blind. That's moment number seven. But at the same time, he learned about Jesus and was called to surrender and fully commit. That's eight. Then, when Ananias came over and healed him, he believed the gospel and was baptized. There's number four. His brokenness came before he was born again. But as a result of these powerful experiences, Paul was almost immediately transformed into a new person with a powerful love for God and his fellow humans. There's 9 and 10, which led him to serve in ministry for the rest of his life at great personal cost. This was all God at work in Paul. Paul just trusted and obeyed and clung to Jesus. We see by this that we don't always have to go through these transformational moments in the order in which Barna listed them. In fact, he says, here we go again. I'm almost done, dude. Come on, computer. <sighs> this is why I completely shut down my computer and open only this one document so that I won't have this problem. So frustrating. All right. One more time. This was all God at work in Paul. Paul just trusted and obeyed and clung to Jesus. We see by this that we don't always have to go through these transformational moments in the order in which Barna listed them. In fact, he says that the biblical pattern is almost always brokenness before being born again. That's how it was with me. And I can tell you that I've had several more brokenness moments after being born again. That's the interesting thing about 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Those can happen over and over again as God works more and more against the nature we were born with to produce in us the nature he intends for us. I'm not claiming I'm perfect yet. You all know I'm not. God and Kathy knows best of all. That I, but God is moving me along. I can at least see the progress and I can give thanks for that and I want that. So in closing, a few questions. How many of these transformational moments have you lived through? Keep that picture, that piece of paper in your bulletin. Look it over again. Are you really a born-again believer? Or are you just being religious and hoping you're saved enough? 
Are you eagerly desiring to go deeper with Jesus? Are you drawn to his word to spend time with God every day? Have you felt that holy discontent? Do you feel like there must be more to this Christian life? Or do you just feel like you're not being fed? Have you been through brokenness? Has God used that moment to lead you to embrace his love for you and fully surrender to his will? Use this teaching to help you evaluate where you are in your walk with Jesus. Eagerly desire to go deeper. Seek out a brother or sister with whom to pray about it. The good news is that the door is always open. And Jesus is always standing right there waiting for your embrace. He loves you. He calls you his friend. So let me just pray a minute. Oh Lord, I do pray that all of us will feel this pull into deeper sanctification, deeper friendship with you, deeper walk with you, better understanding of your word, more awareness of your Holy Spirit at work in us so that as we cling to you this way, we bear more fruit and see souls saved through our ministry. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name.